Good afternoon, buenas tardes. Welcome and bienvenidos everyone to our second episode of Pandemia, the series of webinars um, about COVID-19 pandemic in the Latino community in our country, in the United States. It has been roughly nine months since we entered this pandemic state and almost a year since we first heard about it. Um, and we know uh, the Latino community is one of the hardest hit by this pandemic in our country. We're living in the middle of this pandemic that has changed the way we live in every possible way, but we're also having witnesses of how science and medical researchers have rapidly in less than a year achieved goals that we wouldn't imagine possible before. A few days ago, the FDA issued the emergency use authorization for emergency use of the first COVID-19 vaccine in the USA, the Pfizer bio and tech vaccine, but we also know there are um, other vaccines in the process of getting the same authorization, specifically Moderna and AstraZeneca, and several others to follow in the next months. But it is also very important, the social research and the social researchers that provide us with important information about the factors that influence how this epidemic, pandemic, impact diverse uh, minority communities in our country, and how in the near future the vaccines will be available and who will have access to them. My name is Luis Alberto Mares. I am the Director of Community Mobilization Programs at the Latino Commission on AIDS, and I have the privilege and the pressure of being here again, joining you as your host and moderator for this webinar that will bring you important information directly from experts on the field of public health and the Latinx community. This webinar is brought to you uh, through a collaboration of three organizations, the COVID-19 Prevention Network, which is a network of researchers, institutions, and medical professionals who are working to find safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19. The Latino Commission on AIDS, an organization based in New York City with national reach that for over 30 years has been working uh, to improve the health of the Latino community in uh, the USA, advocating for better services and fighting for um, uh, fighting disparities in the health of the community. And Unidos US, a trusted nonpartisan voice of Latinos serving the Hispanic community through research, policy analysis, and advocacy efforts, working on the areas of civil engagement, uh, civil rights, immigration, economy, health, and housing. The three organizations have joined efforts to bring you this series of three webinars uh, around COVID-19 from different perspectives. And uh, today is the second one, and we will have our third in January 14 next year. Today's webinar is titled, The World We Live is in a House of Fire, and the People We Love Are Burning, uh, a phrase coined by Sandra Cisneros that we are using because our community, the Latinx community, is being affected disproportionately by this pandemic and our people, the people we love, has been dying uh, of COVID-19 in numbers we never imagined. This webinar was scheduled to create a space where we can talk about our community's health during COVID-19 uh, and how we can work together to put up this fire. And this is something that needs to be accomplished with the participation of everyone, not just doctors and researchers, but also everybody in the health field, medical researchers, social researchers, and us, the community. We will also learn about COVID-19 Prevention Network and the work that this network has been doing uh, to reach where we are now with vaccines available for COVID-19. As with previous webinars, our presenters come not only from different parts of the country and different areas of work, but also as a clear example of the diversity of our community, they come from different countries. Today, we have four presenters or panelists. Uh, Guillermo Chacón, president of the Latino Commission on AIDS based in New York, as I mentioned, and originally from El Salvador. Sandra Echeverria, professor of public health at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, and originally from Ecuador. Carlos Rodriguez Diaz, professor of public health at the University of George Washington in the District of Columbia, and originally from Puerto Rico. And um, Dr. Helen Stankiewicz, Carita from the University of Washington in Seattle, originally from Paraguay, and graduated as an MD in Argentina. And I'm your moderator for today, also based in New York City, uh, originally from Peru. It is always great to see such a great diversity of people and experts in our webinars that represent our community as it is, very diverse. At the end of the presentation today, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. We want this webinar to be participatory and, and conversational with you, the people that is attending the webinar. So please write your questions and answers and, and, and comments in the Q&A box so we can read them to our presenters when we reach the part of the webinar. Also, those friends who are joining us through the Facebook uh, page, please write your questions on the Facebook um, under the, the video. At this moment, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones muted if for any reason you have not been muted automatically when you log in. And also, the webinar is being recorded, and you will receive the presentation and the link for the recording after the webinar is completed. As I mentioned, this webinar is also uh, available. It's being live streamed through the Latino Commission on AIDS Facebook page. 
Before we go ahead and start the presentation, we would like to administer a quick poll, and I hope this time works. Um, yeah, allow password, launch it. Okay, so you can answer this poll. It's just for us to know um, who is with us today, where you're getting from, and you guys see it, right? Okay. Just one minute. Seventy percent have reported, so I'm going to stop it right now. Um, I'm going to share the results. All right, so um, let's see. People are joining us from a lot of places. Uh, most people are joining us from south of the country, um, and we have people also from outside the country. We have five participants from outside the country. Um, most people are between the ages of thirty to forty-four. And most people here today are women. Um, and the variety of organizations they work with, most people are from CBOs, but we also have from governmental institutions and the educational institutions. All right, thank you very much. Um, I wanna stop sharing and do we save this information? So, um, So now I will let Guillermo Chacon, the president of Latino Commission and ASEAN, my boss, to start with the webinar. Guillermo will inform us about the way the Latino Commission and ASEAN work um, together with other CBOs have been responding to the COVID-19 mm -hmm. and the importance of why Latinos should engage in COVID-19 research and public health. Guillermo. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's it's my, my pleasure and on behalf of the, the Latino Commission and the Hispanic Health Network, also we are founders of the Hispanic Health Network who is focused to deal with health disparities and health uh, in general in the Hispanic Latinx communities. It's my dear pleasure, you know, and, and then my profound uh, condolence for all of those that had lost family, relatives, co-workers and friends uh, everywhere, because this is a global pandemic. Um, it, it really, the title capture, a, you know, unprecedented public health crisis with a high human cost. And I'm, I'm, I'm very special uh, touch of chair this stage with Carlos, who I love, respect, and admire very, very much. Equal learning about the amazing work of Dr. Echeverria and Dr. Stanwich. It's amazing to come together because only united we will overcome this crisis. Uh, the commission, basically, we chopped down on March 12th. We were the early CBOs who decided to chop down the organization. We begin to uh, put in place in a, in a protocol that we have been sharing this with other colleagues, learning from our partners, African-American organization, Asian-led organization, uh, native organizations because it was clearly that this pandemic landed on top of many other epidemics that we have been fighting. And, and on top of that, you know, the, all the challenges of accessing care. That is one of our first main priorities to advance. The commission also began to assess all our programs to immediately begin to transform and offer and enhance our virtual footprint. In some cases, like in our Latino religious leadership program, we immediately were able to allow to uh, making sure that every single congregation that we work with provide equipment or support support equipment to close the gap. A huge when you look at the nationwide technological gap of our community of our communities. Uh, 
uh, and in terms of our program, the Latinx Oasis uh, Wellness Center, we begin also to try to schedule appointments through different means to connect with people from WhatsApp to Facebook, through the web-based uh, inter interactions. And this is something that we were debating for a long time before COVID, and I think COVID forced us to advance all those areas. Uh, in terms of the uh, capacity building in Latinos in the South program, because we were working already remotely, we just you know, enhanced and began to customize our response to that. It was clearly enough for us that testing, contact tracing, and then advocating for the advancement of treatments and now vaccines is the way to go. But immediately we were clear that the superhighway to, to really impact was to engage with uh, COVID-19 prevention network. Uh, an amazing collaboration nationwide because Latinos and Latinas, we have to get engaged in research, support these initiatives, not only because it's the trigger for resources, but also we know that, that only science is the best way to confront a public health crisis. Uh, the Latino Commission with all our partners, uh, we are part of several networks. Uh, we strongly believe that partnerships and collaborations is the weight. We are alarmed on the impact in Puerto Rico, over 1,200 deaths. Uh, you look major cities from LA to New York, uh, to uh, the South, uh, Latinos and Latinas, along with African American and Native Nations, you know, heavily impacted. We truly believe that uh, this panel will share uh, and pay more attention about that the house is on fire and we need all hands on deck, especially now go deep on vaccinations, but never walk away from preventing the spread of COVID and also to re-engage on HIV, hepatitis, STIs, all of those other epidemics that equal impact our community along with so many. We're the fastest growing, but every single indicator is terrible for our communities. Our health, our future will depend on what we do, each of us to make the difference. Thank you. I only give, they only give me five minutes, by the way. I think I used it as wisely as I, I was able to do it. Thank you very much, Guillermo, uh, for sharing with us uh, about the work that the Commission has been doing to address the impact of this epidemic in our community and how the Commission has adapted to work through these times as well. Um, I'm a witness of, because I'm part of the Commission and I've been going through this process with all my coworkers and colleagues. It's, it was very, very interesting how we adapted and, and we continue working to provide the services that we have been providing to the community all this time. And also important to what you mentioned that why it's important that we Latinos engage in, in research and public health. So before we go ahead, uh, I'm, we're going to uh, do a second poll, very short. This is shorter than the other one. Um, polling two. Launch polling. All right. So this is now that the vaccine is available for some places. Uh, are, are we willing to receive it? Are we willing to take it? And what we're doing also, I would like to remind you um, to please write your questions and comments in the Q&A box uh, for our presenters for the moment that we reach the conversation part of the webinar. All right, so most people have replied. I'm gonna stop the poll here now. And I'm sharing the results and we see that 71% of people who is attending the webinar and have replied to this poll is uh, willing to take the vaccine for COVID-19. And of course, there's some people who would like to know a little bit more about these vaccines to be able to take it. Only 7% says not yet. Um, probably will they, we'll be able to um, find out why and maybe try to change this anyway. So um, let me check. Yeah, to continue. 
the webinar now we have Sandra Echeverria from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Sandra has a PhD in public health from Columbia University in New York City and will share with us epidemiologic information about our community and what socioeconomic factors affect the impact of COVID-19 in the Latinx community. So Sandra, it's all yours now. Thank you so much, Luis, and hello everyone, welcome. Um, before I begin, I just want to extend my um, thank you and appreciation to the webinar organizers for inviting me to be on this distinguished panel. I also want to thank people behind the scenes, such as Drs. Michelle Andrasik, Stefan Wallace, and Brian Minalga um, for coordinating this effort and leading us under the COVID-19 Prevention Network. And as Guillermo already noted, we're using the brilliance of author, poet, and change agent Sandra Cisneros. If you don't know about her work, she's a Mexican-American poet, writer, change agent, as I mentioned. And she was really the inspiration behind our talk. And you're going to hear more details later about our efforts to promote equity and vaccine access for Latinx people. Um, but I want to be clear that while equity and vaccine access for Latin, Latinos, Black, Native American, and other vulnerable groups is crucial, given that they disproportionately suffer the burden of death and severe disease we are seeing in these groups, it's important that we also recognize that the promotion right of vaccine equity has to be done in light of the broader context under which Latino families and individuals currently live. Um, and Guillermo noted this, and I'm going to then walk you through some of these broader structural conditions that are actually some of the key drivers of the increased rates of infection we're seeing and deaths in our communities. And so in the spirit of Sandra Cisneros, we need to put out these fires. And one way that we're going to be able to put out these fires is to understand and act upon these broader social inequities that are shaping risk to begin with. So in case you're not familiar, um, I think we have a lot of um, Latino serving organizations like people of Latino origin, but for in general information, if you're not familiar, the Latino population has grown significantly over the last few decades. Currently, we represent about 17% of the population in the United States. And by the year 2050, we are projected to represent, we will represent about 30% of the population in the US. We also accounted for a significant about 52% of the growth of the US population. And you'll see in a bit when I cover the importance of this is because population growth, right, obviously allows us to keep continuing our population and also infuses any, any country with the necessary labor force to keep the economy growing. Next, please. And as Luis and other and Guillermo mentioned, um, it's important for us to also then understand um, some of the basic socioeconomic conditions under which Latinos currently live in the United States. And um, we know that right now we're in a current uh, 2020 census year, so we should have more precise data released soon if everyone was counted, right? And so we faced a lot of challenges on that front. But for the most recent, for the 2010 census data that we have, and these numbers have changed somewhat with more updated population estimates, um, but these are some of the trends that we see when we compare the Latinx population to Latin Latino whites, for example. So we are a much younger population, so an average age of about 28 years compared to about 41 for Latin Latino whites. About 40% of Latinos are born outside of the US. So I want you to keep that in mind, right, again, for in terms of what the Latino population looks like today and what it's projected to look like, the vast number of Latinos are actually born in the US, right, 60 to 70 percent. Um, we also, though, suffer from a lot of social inequities, and so education being a key driver of those social inequities. Um, among surveyed participants um, about that are 25 years or older, about 40 percent have only completed a high school education. Uh, sorry, have completed a, a high school education only compared to about 10% among non-Latino whites. So, so a significant difference, right, in moving beyond high school education. And then also the percent of people that live in poverty and the also income is relatively lower um, compared to non-Latino whites. And this also includes people who suffer from food insecurity and lacking public, lacking health insurance. So as you see here, about 30%, and again, these figures have remained the same about over the last couple of years, 30% of Latinos lack health insurance compared to about 10% for non-Latino whites. Next, please. Uh, 
And so this is at least one element and my colleague, Dr. Rodriguez, will follow up here um, shortly with more information as specifically as it relates to COVID-19, right? But it's really crucial for us to understand the potential sources that are driving the excess exposure um, among Latino communities. So for example, when we look at working adults in the nation, and this is in a report produced by the US Labor Census um, Bureau, we see that Latinos largely have, as we saw before, right, among the working population, have the highest rate of having less than a high school diploma. So about 28% compared to about 6% among Asian Americans, 8% among Black or African Americans, and about 8% non-Latino whites. And obviously then this higher, this, this larger portion of the population that has low levels of education means that they also then don't have higher levels of education, right? Leading up to college. So about 19% have earned a college degree or higher compared to 60% among Asian Americans, 27% among Black or African Americans, and about 38% among whites. And so we wanted to give you these data because again, we wanna be mindful of what this may represent, right? In terms of who is able to work from home, right? Given those social inequities that Latinos already begin with prior to this epidemic and that were exacerbated now with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so here we look more specifically at the types of um, occupations that Latinos are generally engaged in. So Latinx people are overrepresented in sales, construction and production sectors, right? So these are the very sectors that have actually been still open, right? So I wanna highlight, for example, the work in my new home state in North Carolina of people that are addressing the work, the health conditions of farm workers. Some of my dear friends in California are doing this work too and have launched initiatives just today that will look at the 12 days of Christmas and an initiative to try to bring awareness about the plight specifically of farm workers. So these are the sectors, right? People that have been working, putting food on our table that have been still engaged in labor while others have had the privilege of being able to work from home, right, remotely and not be exposed. And so as you see here, a large segment of the Latino population works in production, construction and maintenance or in provision of sales, right, labor force. And these again have been those forces, those labor uh, groups that have been out still involved in working and burden and suffering the higher burden of exposure and ultimately death. So with this background, we wanted to set that stage for these social conditions and one of those key drivers that is driving exposure in our community. And now we're gonna be followed by Dr. Rodriguez, yes, and his work related specifically to COVID-19. Oh, I have one more slide, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> and so given this, um, this extra burden of um, places where Latinos tend to work, we've seen this play out, right, in the COVID-19 pandemic and what those numbers look like for our communities. So when you look at people who have been diagnosed, right, those who have been hospitalized, right, you see a significantly higher burden among Latinos and whites, and among Latinos compared to whites, right, in terms of cases, hospitalizations, and slightly higher um, for deaths. But this is also very variable. There are other determinants that are hidden within this average. Um, so again, right, those broader social conditions, those structural conditions that shape where Latinos work, where they live, are driving some of these increased disparities. And while again, our focus today will also be about equity and vaccine access, it's important for us to contextualize that vaccine access and push for equity and access, but also understand what those broader determinants were that increased these infections to begin with. Now with that, I will leave it to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for this brilliant presentation that helps us understand uh, these factors that determine and are associated with health disparities in Latinos and in minorities in our country, and how um, factors like if we are able to work remotely or not remotely also affects our uh, risk of being uh, exposed to COVID-19. Um, and now we have an expert on social determinants of health, as Guillermo and Sandra mentioned. I must say also from the very beginning of this pandemic, I've been uh, attending conferences and, and webinars and I've seen Carlos present about this topic in a very effective and clear way. And we have Carlos uh, today 
uh, a professor of public health at the George Washington University in DC, is going to talk with us about um, social determinants of health and COVID-19. Carlos. Hi, good afternoon, good morning. Saludos, gracias. Thanks again for the opportunity uh, and for all of, all of you behind the scenes making this webinar possible. Again, my name is Carlos Rodriguez Diaz. I'm Puerto Rican, currently in Washington, DC. Uh, and I'm affiliated with George Washington University School of Public Health. And as mentioned by Luis, uh, since very early in the um, pandemic, I started working and doing some research, uh, mostly social epidemiology and the translation of findings that we were um, getting out of the experience of the pandemic into practice. Um, surprisingly, early in the pandemic, none of us was an expert in COVID. We were not uh, we were learning about the pandemic as the pandemic was happening. Um, many of us have in common previous experience in the HIV world uh, and working with communities um, disproportionately affected by the HIV epidemic. And fortunately, because we learn uh, by the, through the work that we are doing with communities uh, with, uh, in response to the HIV epidemic, we've been able to translate that knowledge into the response to the COVID pandemic. Um, as previously mentioned by my colleagues, uh, an essential component of responding to this pandemic specifically with the Latino community is understanding the social structural factors that are influencing why more Latinos are uh, represented among cases and deaths in the United States. Um, Something that we know already, we knew before the pandemic is that for health outcomes, we cannot only look at behaviors. And in this pandemic, early in the process, we were almost blaming people for getting infected because they were not using masks, they were not keeping social distance um, or were not uh, getting enough information about COVID. But that's very irresponsible approach in public health because we know that behaviors only explain a part uh, of the uh, health outcomes that we see in our populations. When we started looking at social structural uh, factors, we started understanding uh, to understand what was going on. And um, as mentioned by, by my colleague, there are some structural uh, factors that are presented differently uh, in our Latino community communities that explain what we are seeing uh, in the pandemic. So first of all, uh, I think it's important to clarify that not all Latinos in the United States are the same or that have a similar experience. We have different experience of migration or uh, a different experience of where we are as Latino. It's not the same to be a Latino in New York City, second generation, than to be a recently mig um, migrant Latino in the border in Texas. Access to services is very different. Your needs as an individual are different. And perhaps how you can navigate a system could be different. So um, one of the studies that we conducted early in the pandemic, looking at data from the first trimester of the pandemic was specifically looking at the diversity um, in the Latino community in the United States and trying to explain why we were seeing more cases uh, of Latinos among infections and deaths. Um, we, are, we are still uh, seeing similar patterns, but I want to give you a brief um, of what we are seeing and, some of, uh, and explain these social structural factors that uh, are affecting the Latino communities, not only because we now know what are the factors, but because we have to create policies and programs that understand those social structural factors, not only to reduce new infections in the next few months, but also to incorporate um, vaccination uh, in the different strategies that we will have um, uh, at the national and local level. And the first message here is uh, based on the, um, what we learn is that we need more localized responses. Yes, we need a national strategy in the United States. I think it's been clear that we've been running a, pan a response to a pandemic without a national strategy. We do need a national strategy, but that national strategy uh, should provide for state and local authorities to um, adapt and respond to the pandemic at the local level because the populations are different and the needs of those populations that are disproportionately affected by COVID are different. 
Um, when we look at the data of the pandemic so far, what we are seeing is that among Latinos in the United States, in the Northeast and the mid Midwest of the country, we're seeing more cases of COVID among Latinos when compared to other uh, racial and ethnic groups. And the reason for those, uh, in, uh, that increased likelihood of getting infected is um, being monolingual speaker, um, staying working while the pandemic is happening. So basically unable to work from home and on, a, on the uh, on ability to keep social distancing. And let me go through those very quickly. There are very limited information about the pandemic. Perhaps if you are in the healthcare system and you are um, accustomed to look for health information, you may think that there is a lot of information about the pandemic. If you turn on the TV, there is a lot of information about the pandemic and COVID. But the truth is that there is a lot of misleading information. The information is not being communicated properly. We need a lot of health communication here. And uh, the communication is not always available in Spanish. And so many Latinos in the United States needs to have information in Spanish in order to do something with that information. So they need to understand the information. Second, many Latinos were in the front line and they needed to keep working even though uh, we had shelter at home uh, practices or uh, mandates because they were considered uh, essential workers. Use as an example, the um, uh, poultry and uh, the meatpacking in in industry it was necessary um, and the, even the president declared those services essential and many Latinos were represented among those, those workers. Uh, and therefore the risk for infection increased because they kept working without having the uh, PPE and the prevention uh, protection necessary. And finally, uh, less social distancing um, is a measure that we were able to capture based on where the people were. Um, and we know that there is a, increased likelihood of having concentration in households in the Latino community for multiple reasons. Having big families, have, having multifamily um, units, or um, living in areas that, that we have high density. And that is conductive to have less social distancing and um, that increases the risk for infection. Not to mention that even when people might stay in the same place, if you have one person that is coming out in and out for work, that person can represent um, a risk to infect people who are not getting out of their homes uh, as part of uh, a prevention method. But again, it was not common for Latinos to stay at home and work from home early in the pandemic. And, we, and finally, when we look at deaths uh, in the Latino community, again, there are social structural factors that are explaining why we're seeing more Latinos dying uh, when compared to other groups. And um, one of those factors is employment. Again, the risk of uh, having exposure at work and um, elevated air pollution. And yes, this is, an, this is also an issue of environmental justice. Air quality has been reported to be uh, of a lower quality in areas where minority groups live. And, and that has a historic reason and unfortunately we're still fighting for it. But the quality of air is associated with developing other health conditions such as asthma. And if you have a pre-existing condition and you get infected with COVID, then you have uh, an increased likelihood of have a uh, disease progression. So again, these are examples of how social structural factors are influencing infection and deaths in our communities. Um, shortly, we, we want to engage in a conversation with you so we can elaborate uh, ideas on how we can use that knowledge and translate it into good practices for prevention and also to help us reaching for um, a vaccine in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for such a clear explanation, again, of social determinants of health and this diversity of factors that affect our community, um, where we work, where we live, and where we are uh, now uh, in terms of this pandemic. So um, and now we're going to go to a fourth and last presenter for today, Dr. Helen Stankiewicz, Carita, uh, an infectious disease physician at the University of Washington in Seattle. And she currently is working in COVID-19 vaccine trials, and she will share with us information about these trials and about also COVID-19 prevention network and the work that has been done so far. Um, right. Thank you, Luis, for the intro. Can you all hear me okay? Good. Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. Muy buenas tardes. Muy buenos días aquí en el West Coast. 
it's uh, I'm honored to be here sharing this um, with, with Sandra, Carlos, Guillermo, Luis, and in and, and the audience. Um, thank you for being here. This is very important, and, and thank you to the organizers too uh, for working hard in getting this webinar together. So I will like to provide a brief overview regarding the COVID-19 vaccine research. There's a lot going on, a lot of information. I won't be able to cover everything. So if you have a specific question, please um, go ahead and ask uh, that in, in the chat box and we will try to answer as many of, of those questions. But before we go over the vaccine portfolio, I'd like to mention a little bit about the COVID-19 Prevention Network or COVID-PN. And this network was established, as Luis mentioned uh, earlier, um, by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the uh, National Institutes of Health, to respond to the global pandemic and fundamentally to address the pressing need for vaccines and monoclonal antibodies to protect people from COVID-19. So this network um, merges four existing uh, clinical trial networks are listed here and the HIV vaccine trial network, which is based here in Seattle, the HIV prevention trial network uh, based in North Carolina, the IV uh, clinical research consortium in, in, in Georgia and the AIDS clinical trials, trial group in, in LA. So it is important to mention that um, the COVID-PN um, ha has been developed very strategically strategically to make sure that all these trials can be compared both in terms of safety and efficacy. So we can, um, because we need all these products as soon as possible in, in, in working all together, we definitely seeing this improvement in, in accelerated um, uh, trials being done. So in the next uh, slide, we can see here, um, um, we can see the the, the currently COVID, uh, the, the trials that the COVID PN is working, and, and five studies are listed here. These are all in phase three uh, um, phases. These are testing the efficacy of the vaccines to see if they can control the virus so people don't get COVID nineteen illness. And I will explain in in um, in a couple of minutes about the efficacy, what that means, and and, and all this um, information coming through the media about um, the different efficacy from the different vaccines. But just to a brief summary, uh, with the Moderna vaccine, uh, this study has met its primary endpoint, meaning they reported on how the vaccine is working in, in the trial, which is um, great news. And the company has reported uh, in a press release that the vaccine was over 90% effective in preventing the COVID-19 illness. And this, based on this information, uh, again, as Luis um, mentioned uh, in, in the intro, the, the, the Moderna applied for this emergency use authorization and the FDA is scheduled to meet actually tomorrow, the 17th, to discuss uh, about this request by Moderna. So it, it is important to mention that, um, again, the, the study will continue in, in all of these studies, even if they are granted in, in emergency authorization use, they will continue to monitor the participants uh, for side effects, for duration of, of, of vaccine uh, protection, among other um, uh, points uh, that are important to follow up. So all the, the studies will continue for at least two years. The AstraZeneca and the Janssen, uh, they both were temporarily paused uh, due to some adverse events that were reported, but they are now reopened. And this trial pauses showed that the system of safety measure is working. I think this also showed the transparency and um, how the scientific community, the different monitoring groups, the FDA are closely monitoring each of these side effects to ensure that these vaccines are safe for the population. With the AstraZeneca, um, they recently reported a 70% a, um, efficacy in, in, in preventing COVID-19 in, in their trials. Uh, we will hear about probably an EU aid application in the near future. Uh, the, the Janssen uh, uh, vaccine is still open and enrolling participants. The Novavax vaccine um, trial will open hopefully this or next week, so um, so very soon. And the Sanofi trial is expecting to uh, open in February of 2021. So um, 
there there are still a lot of opportunities for people to participate and, and contribute in these important uh, studies. And, and please note here that the Pfizer is not listed, and, and this is because Pfizer is operating uh, independently uh, from this private-public uh, partnership. But the vac their vaccine is also comparable to the Moderna vaccine, and they also re reported an efficacy of over 90% in, in the study participants. So, um, and last week on, on December 11th, they, they, um, the FDA issued this first emergency use authorization for the first COVID uh, vaccine uh, to, prevent, to prevent the COVID-19 uh, illness in persons who are 16 and older. So this is a major achievement and um, thousands of healthcare workers in um, nursing home residents are currently being vaccinated and I'm looking forward to my vaccine as well. Um, and let me go to the next slide, please. I One more point that I would like to make here in, and here we just have the first study in, in the COVID-PN lineup, which was the COVID study in partnership with the Moderna and they enroll about 30,000 participants. And look at the Latinx participation that makes about 20% of those who enroll in the study. This is about 6,000 participants, Latinx participants, who, are, who contributed in the study in, in the search for a COVID-19 vaccine. And this representation is very important and it's important to enroll participants from different communities not only because of biological reasons, it, it's, it's not really about the biology, as, as we know race and ethnicity are social constructs that reflect um, social positions, but we really need this representation because our community has been disproportionately affected by the virus and these vaccine trials needs to target those who are at high risk and so we can demonstrate that the vaccine will protect well those who are at, at high risk of COVID uh, infection. And, and to this end, the, the COVID-PN has established these expert uh, advisory panels of, with members representing the different communities that are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And, and the expert panel is looking into community engagement uh, and taking uh, ethic considerations with respect to the different populations. And, and with, with that, I would like to, to ask uh, Sandra and Carlos who are representing us in, uh, in, in this expert panel to, to provide your perspective and your experience as, as panelists. And also, um, you know, thank you for, for representing us in this important task. So I will, sorry, Luis, you were saying something? You're muted, Luis. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying thank you, Helen, for, for explaining to us um, the importance and, and, and about the, the trials that are currently going on about vaccines for COVID-19. And yes, we have like a few more slides that Carlos and Sandra are going to talk. And we'll have you back for one more slide at the end. So Carlos and Sandra. Sure. So um, as part of this, uh, partnerships with NIH and the, uh, the private industry and COVPN. Um, there are several community engagement um, uh, activities uh, as mentioned by Helen. And one of those are having expert panels from um, underrepresented communities. And the panels are um, encompassed of members of the community who are also experts in the public health or clinical um, area of knowledge of matter for, for the study of, of vaccines for COVID-19. And Sandra and I are part of the um, Priority Population Expert Panel for Latinos. Um, this panel started meeting right after um, this, the COVID-19 Prevention Network was established. And we have met several times. I don't know, Sandra, about you, but it's, I don't know how many times we've met, but all the times that have been necessary to provide feedback to the companies who are developing this vaccines. We have provided feedback in the design of the studies, uh, the recruitment of participants with a special emphasis on Latinos, of course, 
Um, and we have discussed very important details to, from how things can be translated to make sure that we have information available in Spanish to how to, en how to engage with community, um, uh, community members uh, in the Latino community. Sandra, if you wanna add something else. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. I think um, one of the other issues we've raised, um, so I think first it's important to recognize that I think there, there was, um, they were receptive to some of our comments and then to others, I think um, the way these um, vaccine protocols have been rolled out, some of them were a little too far along or because they're not research focused, it left us, I think, a little bit hungry for additional data, right? So for example, one of the issues that I know we raised was again, um, when we think about these structural conditions that shape populations is not being able to have the data related to who is being exposed, who is being vaccinated, right? Having more data on exposure. And so that to me is something that I think we will have to figure out later on, right? To be able to characterize who is getting the vaccines and when they do become infected, where is it being prevented? Um, where is it happening? Um, where, um, so that we can make really informed, right? Um, decisions about how well this vaccine is working. But um, I have, like you said, um, been pretty um, satisfied with the response by the, um, the vaccine companies and our discussions with them. We've had many, I think for each one, we've had at least three meetings and lots of documents we've reviewed. And again, I think um, we've tried to put in as much input as we could. Um, and some of them were um, reflected in changes they made and others were not. Um, just because again of how this was rolling out and just the multiple vaccines and different companies involved. Um, so I think there's still work to be done there, um, and I look forward to us being able to still continue to inform, right, future work related to vaccine equity um, and who will have access, and again, getting more data about who actually makes it into the vaccination process. And here in this slide, you have the names of um, all the um, Latinos who were part of the Latino expert panel. Um, you might know some of these names because uh, they are very well known in our Latino communities. Um, but I, I can tell you that um, it is a very diverse group of people uh, with different expertise uh, from legal expertise to community health, clinicians, OBGYNs, experts in maternal child health, um, and others that are expert in cult cultural aspects uh, of, the, of our Latino communities. And that was very important to enrich the, the conversations that we had. I think that it is important to also highlight that um, as part of our work uh, in this panel, we have met with the CDC as they were collecting information for the rollout or the logistics for the vaccine. And we were able to raise important questions about the prioritization and the ways of reaching out to Latino communities in the United States. Um, and also we are getting information about the results of the clinical trials presented by Helen very early uh, as some of the companies are, are uh, reporting back to us. Um, and, and again, uh, that is uh, only when they are willing to do it, but they've been willing to do it. Um, and I think that they would use uh, the feedback that we are providing also to make interpretations of the findings because the research that they're conducting is not only to prove the efficacy and efficiency of the vaccine. Uh, we, will we will have a lot of data um, to go through um, and we are just beginning. Uh, of course, getting to the vaccine that works is the ultimate outcome and we are getting there with more than one of, of the um, trials that we're running. But we also want to understand how is it working and also how it worked to roll out a vaccine trial. Because historically, we know that Latino communities have been underrepresented in clinical trials, and we need to fix that problem. Um, so here we have more information about the um, uh, vaccine. Um, so Helen, I think this is a section that um, you can drive us through the uh, findings that we're getting out of the trials. Yes, very briefly. And uh, again, I would like to emphasize the important work that you, Carlos and Sandra are doing because 
when I'm a clinician, like to recommend this vaccine to my patients from, from the Latino community, I, I always highlight that we have people like Carlos and Sandra watching, representing, you know, monitoring and looking for uh, ensuring that the process is transparent and, and, and again, and we safely and with, uh, con with confidence, we can um, recommend the vaccination to, to our patients. So that, that is very, very important. And um, the last point that I would like to just clarify, I think there's a lot of information again in the media about this, the vaccine efficacy and in what does it mean, the percentage, some of them are 95% of um, efficient and then some of them are like 70%. So uh, what does it mean? And uh, I think it's important to understand. So if I save 95% efficacy, at doing what exactly? So, and, and to answer that question, I, I think it's important to mention that all of these COVID vaccine studies are asking the same question. So, and this is how the trials were harmonized by the COVID-PN and, and the different uh, public um, uh, private partnerships. So first of all, we are asking uh, if this vaccine will keep people from getting sick with COVID-19. So this is what we call the primary endpoint. And as a secondary endpoint, we are asking if these vaccines will keep people from getting really sick from COVID-19, uh, sick to the point that they will need to be in the hospital or, or need a breathing machine. So those are the two questions. And uh, this primary endpoint upon uh, which this 90% efficacy was determined is again, based on the prevention of a clinically recognized disease. And again, not the asymptomatic population. And that's an important point that I, I will explain in a moment. But, but just to give you a more concrete example, for example, with the Moderna uh, trial, the Moderna va vaccine uh, study, they, they reported uh, 196 people among all those uh, 30,000 that they enrolled. So 196 uh, became ill with COVID illness. And uh, of those, 95 were in the uh, ill in, in the group that received the placebo, and only 5% were ill in the vaccine group. So regardless of that numbers and, and, and percentage, I think the, the, this is clearly showing that those who were in the vaccine group were less likely to become ill with COVID-19. And that's the major message. That's where the, this 95% uh, efficacy is it's coming from. And, and in the secondary endpoint is again, the protection against this disease that will require a hospitalization or a hospital intervention. And again, using the example of the Moderna trial, uh, they reported 30 people that were or developed severe COVID illness, and all of them were among the placebo or, or control group. So none of those who received the vaccine became severely ill with COVID-19. So that is the message of this uh, efficacy in, in, in effectiveness. And, and uh, technically those words are slightly different. We use the word efficacy just to, to tell how the vaccine performs or protect the community in a very um, controlled circumstances like in a clinical trial and effectiveness is just the same uh, level or, or looking at that level of protection but that, that we will have from the vaccine, but in real life. So as we roll out these vaccines to the public um, in, in the community, we will have information about the, the effectiveness of the vaccine. And, um, and, and one thing that I would like to point out is that uh, none of these studies are really asking the question if if the vaccine will prevent people from getting the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2. Remember that COVID-19 is the disease when people have symptoms and the SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that can infect persons and uh, that can lead to um, asymptomatic uh, illness or or the COVID-19 illness with people with uh, presenting with respiratory symptoms, uh, GI symptoms, et cetera. But again, I, I think 
we are uh, all of these studies were just focused on the COVID-19 illness because there are so many people getting sick and dying from from the COVID-19. So that were, was the urgency on, on on looking for an answer. How can we protect uh, people from getting sick and, and, and dying? So um, that is um, again important to notice. And um, let me see if we can uh, here in this slide we can we can see again. Uh, what exactly this this mean, right? So that getting a vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine, could keep you uh, from getting sick if you get the coronavirus, and also if if you get the COVID-19 vaccine, could save could, could save your life if you get the coronavirus. So it doesn't mean that you won't get the virus, that you can't exp spread to the community or, or infect other people. That doesn't mean that you should stop wearing your mask or, or start gathering with, with other um, with other friends or family. So, and, and, and that's kind of like the last point that I would like to make is, is the vaccine may not have this public health impact for several months. So if you get the vaccine, it will protect you but from the public health perspective, it will take several months until we see that positive impact from the vaccine. So that is very important because we need to keep wearing our masks, washing our hands, keep our social distance and, and keep, um, you know, follow the, the public health guidelines to prevent COVID and, and, and infections in, in our family, in, in our coworkers, in our, commun in, in, in our communities. So with that, I, I think uh, now I, I would like to open this question to, to the panel regarding concrete recommendations that we can do to stop the pandemic and, and how we can work together to put this fire out. Uh, I think it's, um, we have in a slide here with some recommendations, but um, I think we can open this for, for, I think Guillermo, you may have some. Yes, thank you, Helen. I think, yes, Guillermo, you can uh, uh, say something about the slides and recommendations that yeah. as no. a leader of the community. I, I just, I just wanna, you know, support this. I just wanna <clears throat> remind all of us because it's like 250 people just in this space. And I know in Facebook also we have, uh, I'm sure more people engage uh, we, we recognize that a lot of elected officials, a lot of uh, consuls uh, from different countries, from Mexico to Central America, South America, are doing education. We, we embrace e everything. But what we are saying is that we need to go a little deeper than that. And I love what you know, the, the panelists have been talking that you know, the research is one important component. But the strategy is, you know, also to engage the community, to engage the private sector, to engage different levels of government. We need to be at the table. That's what we want to also remind, because when the house is on fire, everybody has to help. It's not like just, oh, no, only the folks in the front of the house has to deal with the fire. No, 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 all of us. And the other piece is that what we want to also validate is that a lot of people have issues with the vaccine. We need to recognize that. But that's the reason we need to go deeper because many of us, uh, also we want to encourage each of us also to discuss with our doctors and go deeper to advocate for our community to have access to healthcare because one of the slides show that right now is like 25% and in some places even higher lack of access to basic healthcare. I wanna remind you also that the couple of years ago, the Office of Minority Health within the CDC did an amazing vital signs about Latinos and Latinas in the US. They're terrible, you know. We, we, they basically outlined that the house was in fire for a long time. We're the fastest growing, but we're the most sick community. And then I always told people, I say, we, know, we, don't, we, we need to reshape the future. By the way, folks, 2021 will be an opportunity for us, but we need to make accountable everyone, independent, Republican, or Democrats. Hispanic Latinos are, as Carlos reminds us, uh, Dr. Helen and Alexandra as well, Dr. Dr. Cheverria, is that we are essential workers, but we're not treated as an essential part of the society. And I think the page that we need to, the only, and the only way that we're gonna turn the page is for us to get engaged, to advocate for help relief across the board. By the way, 
the largest movement uh, in, in terms of the internal migration has been to the South. That means the South will be the future of us. And when I talk about the South, I include Puerto Rico on that. But uh, Puerto Rico, especially with this special detail, because Puerto Rico have two lakes, right? One on the beautiful island and one a big lake in the mainland. And then again, I really call to all of us that it's not about uh, subtract or, or, or apply division. The good organizer is the one that add and multiply it. And that's what we're talking about. But we need to be bring innovation and ask that the incoming administration truly invest in research, public health, infrastructure, and also uh, to change the, the rules of engagement and accessing healthcare. And a very important line across the board is to confront the stigma, especially homophobia, transphobia, and xenophobia. And by the way, folks, the racism is also within us. And then, and then I, I tr because sometimes people think it's about black and white. No, it's about, about the entire society. And finally, clinical trials is a foreign concept and research and development for treatments and vaccines is very foreign for our community. We need to go deeper on those issues to increase uh, the conscience, the social conscience of us that being uh, proactive with our health defined to be there for the long run for our loved ones, our family, and more important, as uh, Dr. Echeverria reminded us, the future look very Hispanic, Latino uh, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Um, Sandra or Carlos, do you want to mention anything about this slide before we go to the questions of the public? Sure. Um, so I think some of the questions already touch on some of these points that we've put on these slides, right? Um, I think what we've, we're trying to do is give you as much information as possible. We're going to now open it up from some specific questions about the vaccines, how they work, um, that Helen can answer for us. Um, but again, as Carlos already mentioned, the public health imperative of masking, physically distancing, and hand washing remains. Um, the vaccine, we do not have any data yet on transmission, prevention of transmission once you're completely, once you're vaccinated. So we need to have still these community measures in place, right, to mitigate that community spread. Um, some of you have been asking about how do we change um, some of the behaviors in our Latino communities. I think I saw a question for someone um, in some instances in Miami specifically. My parents now live in Miami. Um, and so we know that some of this continues. And I, and I say that education is still important. We want to educate people about the importance of these measures, but also taking it a step further back, right? So this is, again, like those public health measures that we need to still promote is that while behaviors are important and we want to educate people, get them to, vaccine, to get a vaccine if that's what they choose to do so that we make sure that we have equity in vaccine access if that's what people want to do. Um, Let's also know that we need to have systems in place that can support those behaviors, right? Behaviors don't arise in a vacuum. They're part of a world in which we live. So if we're seeing this congregation in places, right, there are policies that are supporting that congregation. There are policies that are supporting, right, people gathering in large places, not wearing masks. So I ask you to then advocate, right, as we're saying here is, be on the lookout, right? Be an activist too in that regard, right? Both do your public health good and also your social good, right? Be informed about what local state level initiatives you should support and get groups of support to prevent, right? So that we can reduce the transmission. And that is really what we have seen. Think about smoking. In the United States, the way that we were able to reduce the high prevalence of smoking was not continuously educating people, although that's important. Again, that's important that remains Central. It was to put bans on where you could smoke, right? You could no longer smoke on an airplane. You could no longer smoke on in restaurants, right? We banned access, right? Easy access through vending machines, right? We created all of these systems and structures so that people could try to do the better, right? Implement behaviors that were more supportive for their health. So the same thing with COVID-19. We have to look at these broader structures that are creating these exposures. And on that, there are lots of different initiatives. I put some together that I thought would be important for us. Just know that today, Congress is discussing, 
right? The extension of support for people during the COVID-19 pandemic. This ends now in December 31 specifically, the, the moratorium on evictions. So housing initiatives are crucial for us, right? Carlos talked about this, right? The conditions under which Latinos live, more crowded housing. So imagine if we now have more evictions and homelessness, right? What that would do for COVID-19. So please get involved. Um, we, You can find your local congressman to call, right? Your Congress representative to be able to enact really an extension, right? At that COVID relief act. Um, there's lots of other groups that you can get involved in. One that I uh, like, it's one, there are many others, the one fair wage movement, right, to ensure that people that work in the service industry have a livable, decent wage to live under. I'm going to post now, some of you have also been asking about farm workers, right, and they have, again, been the people that have been putting food on our table, literally and figuratively. I have friends in California that are working in the Central Valley, right, and just the horror stories that have come out of that. And so they've started a campaign there. I'll share it and put it on the um, chat box for those of you who also want to get involved to ensure that any relief does happen even for farm workers and regardless of documentation status. So we also need to talk about that, right? And push for that, right? And our voices will be essential in that regard. Thank you very much, Guillermo and Sandra, for this call to action uh, to our community and what we need to do in order to continue addressing this pandemic, not only in the health area, but in the social area as well. So now we have like um, 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes for questions that we're going to read from the Q&A box. Um, and if we don't uh, get to answer all the questions, please write the e email them to me and I will forward them to our panelists. So um, let's see, we have 22 questions here. Um, uh, um, Cristina Herrera, in New York City, Trans Latino Network has been providing COVID-19 education and discussion. We have already begun to discuss vaccines and many of our clients are open to getting it. There has been a couple of our clients who have participated in the vaccine trials and they have discussed how things went to them. Many of our clients and staff are receptive. Okay. Oh, thank you, Cristina, it's a comment. Um, the Trans Latino community in New York, um, they are eager and open to participate and receive vaccines. Um, Rudy Hernandez, in reference to us Latinos being one of the highest population with COVID, I think to be true that some of the re reasons could be lack of information, poor education, and many of us tend not to follow guidelines in general. I really think if that not that much needing information in Spanish because all Spanish TV networks are talking about following guidelines 24 seven, but to listen and follow guidelines here in Miami, there are Parties going every weekend in houses and private clubs, and Latinos are the first to be there. No mask. Oh, another opinion. Just my opinion. The panelists. Will. Thank you, um, Rudy. I'm gonna look for a question. Um, okay, Kathleen Smith. As an advocate for migrant farm workers, I'm particularly concerned about masking, making sure that the vaccine reaches farm workers, especially consideration is needed for undocumented workers in animal agriculture, such as working. Uh oh. -uh. And it moves. But in, in the extent of time, a bit yes. I was reading some of the questions. Okay. Uh, folks were asking, uh, it's a couple of very technical vaccines that I would recommend that maybe we, we email back the PowerPoint presentation we send to all the participants. We ask you to send it to your own networks. We encourage also another question was about, you know, many examples of Spanish initiatives, you know, the Consul General of Seattle in New York City, you know, in many places, yes, you know, we welcome all of that. And I think we need to uh, be proactive. Also a lot of comments and question was about uh, concerns of people about the side effects of vaccines. And for that reason, you know, I believe I mentioned and a couple of the panelists mentioned that was important also to encourage conversation with your primary care. But a lot of people were saying, you know, where can I send folks, you know, and then I believe all of us, we need to, if we know the folks that are in charge of coordinating uh, the COVID response uh, uh, in our city, in our county, in our state, we need to always encourage people that we advertise in, in the ethnic media, especially in Spanish, those centers and ensure that those centers will not be asking uh, immigration questions because people are afraid, you know, it's a segment of our community 
that Carlos, I think, remind us about many households are combined, are mixed. You know, I have family that are, you know, folks with uh, uh, a, 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 an immigration status that, that you know, raise concerns um, in, in the entire family. Other people have a, a temporary protected status. Somebody else have a permanent resident and somebody else have a citizenship. And then that's the reality of us, of a segment of our population. And the other piece people were asking about also, where can I access education? One thing that I can tell you that the researchers here in this panel and some of them uh, medical providers, they have a special commitment, but also we need to ask for more voices folks that are bilingual, fully bilingual, to through these venues, through direct engagement, something that we do is we invite experts from uh, Pfizer, from uh, uh, Moderna, from Johnson & Johnson, uh, to come and speak to us, and also folks from developing treatment for, for, for COVID. But again, we need to be proactive. Nobody will carry the water for us. We need to take, do a line and be passing the water to make sure that we need to take good care of our communities. Because again, we're the fastest growing, but we're the seekers and also paying a high a price on death. And that is unacceptable. But again, we don't know a lot about COVID. That's the other piece that we need to go deeper. Uh, is this research community is going deeper to understand the, the short, mid-term, and long-term effects, and so on. And then we truly need to understand that this has been a shocking for the global community, but this is not the last one. We better prepare because things are coming in our way. And if we don't learn from this horrible, with a high human cost, over 100, 300,000 folks in the U.S., and then, you know, shame on us. And then again, but we cannot forget that only together in integrating our best of all of us is how you overcome guided by science and data and research. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Hey, Helen, yes. Yeah, briefly point out, there's a lot of, like you say, technical questions about the vaccines. Uh, feel free to, you know, email or email Luis or Brian. I'm I'm happy to to chat more about any of these questions. I will like you know all of these answer needs to be or question needs to be answered so we can also transmit that to our families, to our friends, coworkers, and in in the community. And I, I think that um, the call VPN has a lot of materials in in Spanish. Brian may know more about this. So um, this is specifically about the different uh, research uh, or trials um, that are available. So, and even videos and so a lot of materials that can be shared. Now there, there, there are a lot of information also on the CDC website, but again, it may not be to the level that is easily under, you know, to understand and or, or um, but, but I think we're posting some of the uh, resources available by, working at, uh, or in the community here in, C here in Seattle with the Eastern Washington, the farm workers, uh, the radio station, and here in, in, in the Western side as well. So we wanna make or bring this or answer this question if possible in a daily basis, because there are so many informations going on all the time. And these are things that will make us decide whether or not we, we will go and participate in a research study or we will go and get the vaccine or not. So. Uh, I think is finding those resources, it's important and uh, sharing with the community. I think we, we don't need to be silos. There's a lot of information and we can all share and get informed or inform our community. So I'm happy to provide uh, specific medical questions or, or uh, address your questions. Um, if please feel free to contact. Thank you, thank you, Helen. And yes, there's has been a lot of information, very important information shared by all our panelists and the comments and the answers to these questions and the call to action. So we ran almost out of time and, and thank you very much. I wanna have one more poll before we leave, um, which is basically the same, but we want to know if you change your mind. So uh, please answer this uh, poll now that we have finished with the webinar. Mm -hmm. Can I leave my final me message? Of well? course. <laughs> yes, so, uh, uh, as a Latina physician who has been working and taking care of these patients, seeing directly and indirectly how the community is suffering and, and being impacted by this virus, I think, and also as a 
Latina scientist who has been following all the, the science and, and the studies and the, the vaccine trials, I think I will go, I will go and get the vaccine. I will recommend my family to get the vaccine. And I will also recommend all my patients to get the vaccine. So please consider it. And if you, you know, like for those who are 23% that need more information, please contact me. I'm happy to, to answer your questions. I just want to, you know, wish us, you know, a, a very special but physical social distancing end of the year. And more important, I want to ask all of us to, to please, 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 uh, 2021 and the next 10 years that we begin to get the results of the census 2020, we need to be on the table because the next three years is going to define priorities. The next year and a half, actually but the next three years are essential that define the distribution of resources for the next 10 years. That's one of the things out of Census 2020. Yes. We need more Carlos, Sandra, eh, Carita eh, to be at the table along with all of us, because if we're not in the table, we become a menu. Be safe, uh, <laughs> our health, our future, familia. Thank you. Yes, um, the poll shows basically the same results as at the beginning. Um, at least we are still engaged in getting vaccinated. So thank you very much to all our panelists, Guillermo, Sandra, Carlos, and Helen. It was an amazing presentation with a lot of very important information. I just want to share also with the people who is attending today that we will have one more last webinar in January, and it's going to be focused on uh, factors like immigration and how this uh, can affect also um, um, our access to to care and vaccines COVID-19. And this will be delivered completely in Spanish. So when you receive this, this uh, email with the invitation, please share it with your community, especially with the people that speak Spanish and immigrants that will need uh, to learn about this as well. So thank you very much everybody who attended the webinar with your questions, your comments and, and, and everything. It's been an amazing webinar actually with a very, very good information. Thank you again, everybody and happy holidays and see you in January. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Un abrazo. Gracias. Helen, Carlos, te, te, te extraño mucho. Igualmente. Uh, espero verlos a todos y a todas muy pronto, face to face. Eh, Beto, eh, eh, ya salió, ahorita está saliendo la gente. Sí. Pero todavía estamos live. Sí. Envíame los dólares que me debes, por favor. Okay. Kirin. <laughs> Bye -bye. Gracias, thank you very much. Gracias, Helen y Carlos, un placer. Gracias, igualmente. Hasta luego, familia. Que estén bien, buena tarde. Gracias. Chao, chao. Chao, chao.